Okay. So today we're going to be covering um, environmental science um, as a general topic in a period of history um, that we refer to collectively as the Anthropocene. And, and we'll get into those in just, um, just a moment. But uh, just to sort of <clears throat> bring us to um, where we are today, we're here. Um, oops. Um, we're here. Um, sorry, I'm looking at Thursday. <laughs> I was like, why, why are we? There is. Uh, so we're here. And then um, there's a review of Blackboard and um, uh, podcast for you on Blackboard. And then I'll post the instructions for the discussion board by the end of the day today. So you can start working on that on Thursday. And just as a reminder, you know, when it's blue on the syllabus, we don't meet in person, well, in person, virtually. So just as a FYI. All right. So at uh, any point you have any questions, say something I don't make sense, you want me to clarify stuff, you want me to expand on something, jump in. Um, either talk or you can just drop a line in the chat and I will see it and um, go from there. All right, so as, as I sort of mentioned, this the topic for today is loosely focused on environmental science, but mostly focused on this concept of what we call the Anthropocene. And so as I sort of mentioned from this course introduction last week, you know, your, your mission for the course is really to, you know, see how you as an individual can be a better steward for the environment. And I like this, um, this little figure, because it's it's like the the you know the classic evolution figure where it's you know fish into things with legs and then into primate and then to man, but it adds like that sort of extra element, right? And we came from nature, and as you'll see throughout this class, we are subject to nature. We couldn't live without nature, but we do lots of sad things to nature. And this gentleman, uh, this portly gentleman, dumping his trash in is clearly one of the things that we do. So. I like this little thing, this little graphic, just to sort of set the stage for, I guess, kind of the whole course. Right? So I'm going to put a, a little question to you guys. What characteristics do you think encompassed all living things on this planet, from the biggest things that have ever lived, like blue whales, down to the tiniest, tiny microbes? What, what are some of the characteristics you guys think life shares in common. And, and I'd like to ask this question because I think it's interesting to see what you guys, you know, I mean, I'm always interested to see what you guys think, but definitely as non-science people, like what you, what you think, what do you, what do you think you share in common with a mouse, right? That sort of question. Oof, that uh, response is overwhelming. Okay. Okay, so the ability to breathe, that's an important thing. Definitely is. Um, we can think about breathing as, uh, you know, uh, related to energy, right? You breathe not because, you know, it's fun, but you breathe because it's related to energy. And as Colleen says, yes, we definitely need energy source like food definitely true. And um, Arafat also said the same thing. Hope, reproduction, exactly everything has to reproduce. Small things, big things. Life's all about passing your DNA to the next generation. Yep, we're all made up of cells. <laughs> I like I like Stephen's explanation. Food comes in one way, it goes out the other. I like that. That is true. Food comes in one way, comes out the other, sometimes more or less. Perfect. Everything's made up of cells. That's also a great one. Big things, small things, we're all cells. That's called cell theory. That's a fancy way of saying it. Cool. Anything else? Is life random? Like, is, are you just like, just like made out of random stuff? Survival is a great one. Yeah. Everything's got to survive. And that's related to reproduction. Everything's, you know, the, the at the end of the day, everything's kind of all about uh, passing your genes on to the next generation. And that's true if you're something big and something small. So when we sort of, as biology people do, um, life is broken down with the capacity to grow and develop, 
interact and respond to the environment. That's going to be an important thing we discuss in this class. Uh, as you guys said, reproduce and process energy. We all have the capacity to self-regulate from the biggest to the smallest. You know, you can think of self-regulation as it's hot, so I'm going to turn the air conditioner on. Or you sweat, right? In that capacity too. Uh, everything is ordered and organized. Life isn't random. If you look at the like the you know the not random. It's heavily organized. It's kind of actually beautiful. And uh, another thing is everything evolves or adapts to the environment. The environment, you know, really pokes things in the right direction. We are the way we are because the environment was poking us in said direction that drove us to be who we are. So it's kind of just a fun little thought, um, a thought, you know, exercise thinking about what life shares in common. And you guys did pretty good. Uh, usually most people only get like one or two things from this class. And you guys got three, which is pretty good. So I'm proud of you guys. But when we look at this, um, when we start to think about life. Life has been on this planet for an extremely, extremely long time. The Earth is about 4.6 billion years old. And we could take that time period and condense it down into a clock. And so in this case, we take that 4.6 billion years and we smash it into one hour. And the Earth crust forms at one second and modern times is at, you know, 59 you know, at 60 seconds, right? At the end of the one hour. What's what's remarkable about this clock to you guys? Has anybody seen a clock like this of, you know, here's the entire history of the earth jam packed into 60 minutes. What do you guys, what is, when you see this, and I don't know why this got cut off, but I, I apologize. It's just first like reptiles and amphibians on the left here. Um, what, uh, what's remarkable about this clock to you guys? Did you expect it to look like this? Did you expect it to look different? Um, after the 12, everything seems like it kind of slows down, whereas like between 11 and 12, a lot of different things were like happening then. Mm, so things get fast at the end. Interesting. That's a good way of, way of thinking about it. Um, there is a reason for that. Um, we're not going to talk about it, but just for your own curiosity, it's oxygen. Oxygen came to be, you know, about here. After oxygen came, life exploded. Good. So lots of things are jam-packed at the end. What else? What else do we see about this? There's a couple of things. Like humans, like we kind of view history in like, I guess a self-absorbed way where it's kind of all focused on like actual human activity, mm -hmm. but <laughs> the actual clock is still. Yeah, that's great. Um, we're gonna talk about that little tiny slice of the clock, but humans, first modern man, 59 minutes, 59 seconds and 0.9999, you know, milliseconds. Yeah, so humans, very, very narrow band of this time. We've only occupied this planet in a very narrow stretch of time, which is remarkable. And we'll get to why it's remarkable in a second. But yeah, humans, tiny slice of the pie. Good, 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 good. Anything else? Doesn't have to be anything. It should be something you think is cool. I think things are cool. Um, something I think is kind of cool is that to think that jellyfish have been around like longer than dinosaurs is kind of cool, and they're still here, you know. So, uh -huh. found that interesting. Yeah, there's a lot of weird stuff that have been around way longer than you would imagine. Jellyfish are one of them. Sharks are also another one of them. Um, insects are also another one of them. And a lot of things have been around for a really long time and have never changed, which is kind of cool, like jellyfish. Yeah, one of the other things that I like, um, and I told you guys I'm a microbiologist, is that most of this clock is uh, microbes. So for the first like 40, 40 minutes, it's all mi microbes. And I think that's cool. So that's just, that's just what I see when I look at it. Nothing else, it's just, just the micro part. So yeah, it's kind of cool, right? I mean, humans are such a tiny sliver. And let's put this into a bigger, bigger context. So the universe we know is about 13 billion years old. That's when the Big Bang happened. That's all scientific evidence points to the Big Bang being the origins of the universe. And that all the science says it's about 13 billion years or so ago. Now of that 13 billion, now remember billions a lot, right? A billion dollars is a lot, right? Just the same way as a billion years is a lot. The Earth, as I mentioned, is 4.6 billion years ago. 
And there's lots of evidence for that if you want to know why it's right there. Um, so humans, though, we've only been around, you know, depends on how you define what a human is, but no more than 3 million years. And it's kind of amazing. And, and just in case you're wondering how life arose on Earth, there's lots of, um, lots of theories for that. Um, the best one is chemical evolution. You can look it up if you so choose. Uh, you can also look up panspermia, which is why I have the ancient aliens guy over here going aliens, because that's like life came from another planet sort of theory. Um, so there are, there are ways we think life arose. But the remarkable thing um, and that one of you brought up is that man is such a tiny slice of this pie. And what you'll learn through this course is even though we're a tiny slice of that pie, we've really changed the planet in an absolutely remarkable way that no other single species has. And that's the remarkable thing about humans. This little tiny 59 seconds, 50, you know, 59 minutes, 59 seconds, so on and so forth. That is so remarkable how much the planet has changed. It's really remarkable. And this part of time that we're going to discuss today, and as the title slide told you, is the Anthropocene. Anthro meaning anthropogenic as in human made, and scene just being an epic. Now, humans, um, depending on who you ask, we've, you know, we came out of Africa. <sighs> Again, depends on who you ask. Uh, it's, it's kind of a up for debate theory uh, thing right now. But we think, you know, anatomically, Homo sapiens, i.e. us, appeared somewhere around 200,000 years ago. Some people say 3 million. It just, it just depends. But know that we came out of Africa at some point in time and radiated all over the planet, which ushered in this unprecedented piece of history, um, this 200,000-year period, this Anthropocene, the time by which humans control the planet, started exerting a force on the planet. And as I've sort of already mentioned, it's a it's a exertion on the planet that just has never quite been seen before. There's no other single species that affects the planet the way we do. And that's like, that's the end. Of, that's sort of like the end of the story there, but we're going to obviously keep talking about it. Now, when we define the Anthropocene, um, it's defined as the Earth's most recent geological time period as being human influenced or anthropogenic based on overwhelming global evidence that atmospheric, geological, hydrologic, uh, so water, biospheric life, and other Earth system processes are now being altered by humans, which is in a, a which is like if you break it down, it like it's incredible, and I, and I have gone back. Um, gets you know impacts human impacts the planet like humans do, but it really is true. Very few things impact all these characteristics like we do, which is re truly remarkable. Um. Just as a sort of a note, um, when you start to talk to people who study, you know, like history of like the Earth and, and eras of the Earth, it's technically this period of time um, that we think of like humans really ramping things up is we defined uh, as the Holocene. So about 12,000 years ago, the Holocene started, um, uh, and uh, it's uh, just as just as a note. So you know, geologically speaking, it's the Holocene. Biology people, you know, anthropology people, sociologists, we call it the Anthropocene. Just just as a note. Um, and it's really a remarkable period of time. And humans are remarkable, not just for our biology or our mental capacity. We're just remarkable by which we change the planet, the effect we have on other species. Usually when, and we'll talk about this idea of species interactions later in the semester, but this idea that we can influence or and drive another species to complete extinction is not, not really a, a natural thing. You don't really see one species pushing so hard on another that it drives it to extinction. That's a uniquely human thing. And so we can look through the fossil records, we can look through the history, uh, both written and, you know, inferred from you know, drawings and all that, you know, and all the things we discover about humans. And we know that humans have a mark, no matter how old we are. So we can see massive megafauna extinctions 50 to, you know, 11,000 years ago. So thinking about the woolly mammoth, the saber tooth tiger, the giant sloths, right? And we can see those throughout time. You know, you can think of even something more recent, like, um, you know, like the dodo bird or any number of things that have gone extinct. So we leave uh, in our wake this sort of record of extinction, things that we push to the brink because of who we are, 
right? Mammoths because they're good to eat and we use their hides and their bones and tusks and all that stuff for our human activities. Um, and just to put this in perspective, you know, native uh, North America lost about 72% of its mammal population once it was colonized by humans. So um, that's, and that's, that was in a relatively short period of time, you know, if you sort of like go back to this map, you'll notice that we didn't make it into North America until about 10,000 years ago or so. So it didn't take us very long to start really pushing things once we got into North and South America, just as a note. Now, the other big hallmark we can see throughout human history, and, and probably don't think about it too much in your average everyday life, but agriculture, um, it's a huge one. One of the greatest technological adv adv inventions of humans, right? You know, we like to think of like cool stuff like the iPhone, or like the internet as being cool, but like agriculture really sets the stage for all of this, right? You can't really support a huge population of big individuals like humans without agriculture. So we invented farming as a practice about 11,000 years ago. And as we'll discuss later in the semester when we discuss food systems, it has a massive impact on ecosystems. So just areas of the world. So like you think of like Massachusetts as its own ecosystem, right? Just all the living and non-living parts of an area. And it has a tremendous impact on biodiversity. And as we talked about in the first class, bio is life, diversity is just how many different types of species you have, right? Or how many different things you have, right? You can think of like a really diverse cohort, cohort, cohort of humans. It's just, you have a bunch of people from different countries around the world, right? That's diversity. So you can think of biodiversity as just really rich amounts of life, lots of species. And humans have poked on this idea of ecosystems and biodiversity since day one of farming. Because farming is, and especially nowadays, but even in the past, it's a credibly destructive practice. And paired with agriculture, we also had domestication of animals. You could think of things that are tasty to eat, like cows. Well, maybe you don't eat, maybe you don't eat these things, but um, I'm sure. Some people think they're tasty to eat, like cows and pigs and chickens and all that fun stuff. Or you could think of something less, um, you know, less tasty, like, well, I'm not gonna say less tasty, um, something we don't eat like a, um, like dogs or even horses. Well, people eat horses, but you know, most people don't eat horses. All right, so bringing in animals in the fold, selecting for traits that we really like in individuals that help us. And again, by domesticating animals, very much like agriculture, we also domesticate, uh, we also change ecosystems. We also change biodiversity just by domesticating things. And I want to um, make a, just a quick note about domestication because it's a really cool thing. So um, I love this figure and I love talking about domestication because I think it's a wacky and wild thing. So domestication is just taking something wild and bringing it into the fold of humans and making it better for humans or easier to, for humans to grow, right? And so I love to show this figure of corn because this is what we eat nowadays. This is what we feed to livestock and all that fun stuff. But on the left, we have this kind of pitiful looking plant, which is called teosinte. And this is the wild ancestor of corn. Now, for those of you that have never seen, you know, these weird types of corn, there are hundreds of varieties of corn out there. They're all throughout Central and South America, both domesticated and wild. Um, but it all started with teosinte, with this little bugger here, this not remarkable thing. And domestication took this, again, not very remarkable thing. Would you want to eat that? Because it doesn't look very appetizing, especially not in comparison to the monster corn we eat here. But we took this unremarkable thing and we domesticated. We brought it into the human fold. We started selecting for traits in this plant that we really liked, that made them more nutritious, that made them easier to grow and maintain, that made them require less water, things like that. So that's what domestication Food, like more attuned for like capitalism almost like making it so it's easier to produce right and uh domestication is a really powerful force when you pair domestication with other technological inventions such as you know machinery or uh, animal power it really leads to some massive changes in human populations and we can actually look at this um from some from data from our friends at the usda and we can look at corn yields in the United States from 1866 up to 2012. And you'll notice from 1860 all the way to 1940, the bushels per acre was, you know, about 20, 
25 to 30 in that ballpark. There's some variability, right, due to weather. Um, but then you see after 1940, it explodes. Bushel yield, um, corn yields in the United States um, per acre, you know, shot well over 160. So huge amounts of corn in a very small area, um, which is cool, right? Now, I mentioned domestication is partially due to this, and that, and that is true. But there is another piece of technolo technology here that happened in the 1940s. Does anybody know what happened in the 1940s besides World War II, obviously? Makes your plants grow big and strong. It's a grass it fertilizer, like good plant. And some fertilizer. Yeah, fertilizer. So the um, there was a process invented in the 1940s called the Haber-Bosch process, which produced industrial fertilizer. That's what happened. So you pair domestication with technology, which leads to huge explosions in food production. It's kind of an amazing thing. And you can imagine if this happens, well, what does this mean for the human population? And the reality is it means a lot. If you can grow a ton of food in a very small amount of area, that means you could support a larger population. And we can actually physically see that when we look at human population over time. So um, as I'm sure you guys know, in 1760s or so, the Industrial Revolution uh, took off, right? You know, 1760 to 1860 in that ballpark. We transitioned from manual power to mechanical power, right? We started harvesting fossil fuels, coal, oil, and gas, you know, as opposed to, you know, using, to, you know, hand tools or animals to plow our fields. We have all this great technology. We have all this great domestication. And you could start to actually look at how that affects human population growth. And so 1800s, there was about a billion people. 2011, there's 7 billion people. And we anticipate by 2050, there should be around 9 billion people. And I love, um, I love showing this graph because it's, it's truly remarkable because you can see, you know, uh, through time, you can see, you know, 8,000 years ago, there's not a lot of people, and it's kind of slowly, slowly, slowly building. And then you, you know, you see some dips, like, say, for instance, you see this huge dip uh, from the Black Death way back in the day, just, just as a note what this big dip is. Um, and then you see it just explode, and it has this huge exponential growth in modern times, 1800s on. So you pair technology with better you know domestication of food and you have this huge explosion of human population and it, and i don't know I, I i show this figure all the time when i teach and i still find it absolutely um remarkable at how quickly the human population explodes right because you can even look back at the early 1900s right our population was 1 billion or 2 billion and we added more people in 50 you know, 50 years than we added the previous billions before. So uh, I'm sorry, the, the few decades before. It's, it's really striking to see how fast this population grows. But this leads us to a nice handy term, which we call the carrying capacity, which is basically the population size that in a given area can support indefinitely. Now, when we think about the human population, there's only so many humans we can physically fit on this planet and still support them. Now, you could think of that's kind of like a lofty goal, right? When you think about modern times, we have about one third of the human population lives below the poverty line and about 25% is food insecure on an every given day. So you can argue that's kind of a hard thing to judge given how meh things are right now for a lot of people. But in theory, there is a limit to how many people on this planet there can be, how much resources we have, both natural and man-made, as well as physical space. And that limit, that upper limit is the carrying capacity. And our current best estimates for the carrying capacity of this planet in terms of humans is about 9 billion people. We don't think it's gonna go any higher than that. Um, uh, and it'll, it'll be interesting to see how it happens because 2050 is when we think we're gonna hit 9 billion and we'll all be alive in 2050. So it'll be really interesting to see how that curve ends up going. Does it keep going up? Does it level off? Does it go down? But we, we shall see in 2050. So check back with me in like, you know, like 30 years. I'll be, I'll be old, be like, you know, heading towards retirement, but check back. So that's, um, that's carrying capacity. That's the human population growth. And I, I again, I, I love, I love showing this because it's just absolutely incredible. Cause you can look at it, 1960, 3 billion, 1975, 4 billion. So in 15 years, we had 1 billion people. It's, it's incredible. 
Now, one of the things that we are seeing is as this population grows, and I guess this is kind of intuitive, right? As you grow your population, you need more resources, right? It's the same thing with the business. As your business gets larger, you need more stuff. And that's the same thing with populations. But the really interesting thing is um, as we grow and grow our population, it's actually led to diminishing resources, right? Resources that are starting to fade. And this is, led, this is because of heavy overutilization of potentially non-renewable resources like gas and oil and coal, but also the overutilization of renewable resources such as timber and space, like land and soil, things like that, and even water. Um, I don't know if you guys, um, just a little tangent on water. We'll talk about water later in the semester, but I don't know if you guys saw that they started trading water on the, the global stock exchanges as a commodity, which is awful. <laughs> Sorry, I saw that the other day and I was like, oh, ugh. people will make money off anything, but I digress. And so um, we have this sort of conundrum, lots of people to feed, we're doing it irresponsibly. And this leads to this really common thing. Um, so if you guys have ever like shared a house or a, a, a dorm with someone or an apartment with someone, you know that some people are just jerks, right? They leave their dishes everywhere. They don't clean up after themselves. They don't flush the toilet, you know, stuff like just stuff like that, right? They're just not nice. We can apply that same concept to the way humans use resources. And this idea of humans kind of being a jerk to nature is what we call tragedy of the commons. And so where we, as you'd imagine, we prioritize short-term gains, which leads to long-term collective fail. Now, you can imagine if we used and used and used, say, coal and we, but as our only resource, and we keep using coal and coal and coal over again, eventually we're going to run out of coal. And what does that do to future generations that might have relied on coal? Well, that kind of puts them in a really, really bad situation, right? And that's what tragedy of the commons is. You overexploit a resource, damaging it, potentially, you know, getting rid of it completely, or damaging it so it's lessened for future generations. And the idea you get this concept of how long can you exploit a system, and this system we're thinking about Earth, before the costs outweigh the benefits? Can you, if you think about like a fishery? Is it does it make sense as a like for say a lobster fishery to take 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 from the lobster fishery if by taking so heavily in the short term it damages the fishery in the long term, right? So it's kind of this weird thing. And so I'd like to illustrate this point um, with one of my favorite stories in all of uh, I was going to say biology, but in all of like human you know, interactions with nature. And it's actually the passenger pigeon. And the passenger pigeon's a great, um, uh, in case you didn't see the, I'm sure you probably saw the picture, but this is what the passenger pigeon looks like. It's not a particularly exciting bird as mo most pigeons aren't. Um, you know, they're, they're just doves that live in the city. And so they're not particularly very exciting birds. They're not like cool, like a toucan or something like that. But the passenger pigeon is a great example of what happens when humans find a resource they really like. And I love to, to start with this quote from some unknown gentleman from Columbus, Ohio, or person from Columbus, Ohio, I don't know. Um, and this picture over here from Wikipedia, and I'll just read the quote, quote real quick. And uh, this person says, as the watchers stared, the hum increased to a mighty throbbing. Now everyone was out of their houses and stores looking apprehensively at the growing cloud, which was blotting out the rays of the sun. Children screamed and ran for home. Women, women, get, women gathered in their long skirts and hurried for the shelter of stores. Horses bolted. A few people mumbled frightened words about the approach of the millennium and several dropped on their knees and prayed. And it's, uh, it's you know, it's, it's kind of like um, the swarm of locusts. If you ever like read anything, you know, biblical in origin, like just blotting out the sun, like this apocalyptic scenario. But the apocalyptic scenario is not, you know, some wrath of God thing. It's just passenger pigeons. And as you can see from this figure, they just swarmed in hundreds of thousands, sometimes millions of birds at a time. And it was so big, they were blotting out the sun. And like, you know, in 1850, you think, oh, well, maybe that's, you know, the, the apocalypse is coming or something like that. But like, you know, it's, it's kind of an amazing thing, right? They have this massive swarm of birds that's so big and so thick, it can actually blot out the sun for a short period of time. Uh, so that's the stage I want to set with the passenger pigeon. This is what they look like in 18. 55 and before. But, uh, you know, this is 
this is a doom and gloom class, uh, as I, I like to say. And, and clearly, the passenger pigeon did not do very well because we're talking about it. And so you can look at people, and people use passenger pigeons for a number of different things. Um, they use them for meat. They use their feathers for stuffing pillows. Uh, they use all parts of the pigeons. And you had people like these four gentlemen, <clears throat> you know, hunting with their rifles and taking a, I, I would, I would suggest as a reasonable amount of passenger pigeons, um, just because, you know, given this swarm, it's, that's, that's a pretty reasonable amount of pigeons to take. And that's probably something you could probably use all of, but I think that's directly in contrast to this picture from 1884, where you have two gentlemen, one of which is standing on top of a pile of dead pigeons. There's a, there's an equally, um, crazy picture such as this um, from Chesapeake Bay. So for those of you that are from the Maryland area, there's a picture like this, but of a guy standing on top of oysters. Um, that's actually pretty classic too. But clearly one of these is sustainable. You know, it saves pigeons for the next generation. And clearly one is absolutely crazy and unsustainable, right? And this, this, this one on the right is much more reflective of how we treated the passenger pigeons than this one over here. And you might think to yourself, all right, it's just one pigeon. Okay, what does it matter? Well, the pigeon went extinct. The pigeon went extinct. And that's, that's, the, that's the moral of the story here. Too much pressure, extinction, right? And once something is extinct, as we'll discuss later, oops, as we'll discuss later in this semester, it's gone forever. But on a, you know, environmental standpoint, well, why do we care about the pigeons? Well, the reality is, we think that the pigeons were pretty important. When you have billions of them flying around the United States, they, they likely played a key role in the health, as well as what we would call the maintenance of North American forests. And a couple of ways these, these pigeons would have done it is by increasing local biodiversity, because lots of things like to eat pigeons. They're easy to catch, they tasty, lots of energy. So that's one, they increase local biodiversity. Second, they maintained the forest as they flew through forest, as they roosted in forest, they broke off old, they broke off dead branches, they um, killed older trees, allowing new growth to come up, allowing forests to regenerate themselves. So they acted kind of like this reset mechanism for forests. Uh, they also poop. And I'm sure you guys have seen maybe something not as drastic as this, um, but pigeons, like all birds, poop everywhere. Um, and passenger pigeon was is no different. And so their poop fueled plant growth and added nutrients to ecosystems that potentially didn't have enough ecosystems. Um, and they really just kind of pushed forests to be better, you know, help themselves along. So that's um, that's that's our dead bird. And 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 we went from this to this in a very short period of time, and we tragedy the commons, frankly, the hell out of passenger pigeons. Right? We overexploited them in a short amount of time, and we drove them to extinction. And that's, that's sort of the stage I like to, to think about, that we had this resource, we overexploited it for our own gains, and now it's gone. Um, and that's, that's sort of the legacy of a lot of things. Um, the other thing I wanted to uh, <laughs> um, make note of about the passenger pigeon is there are actually um, some folks at Harvard, if I'm not mistaken, I think it's Harvard. Uh, they're working on actually de-extinction of the passenger pigeon. So they're taking museum specimens um, and using the genomes of those to re, you know, essentially de-extinct these organisms. So I figured I'd point that out there. Um, I think it's kind of cool from like a genetics, like think about like Jurassic Park, but for passenger pigeons, that's what they're doing. Anyways, so that's the passenger pigeon. That's tragedy of the commons. But why do we care about Pigeons. Well, I mean, pigeons are just one example, but what happens when we keep pushing on the earth as a system? And that's, that's sort of what we're doing. We're at, at this sort of point in time, you know, the extinction of the saber-toothed tiger or the passenger pigeon, the dodo bird, that's one thing, right? They're just animals. But what we are doing in the Anthropocene is pushing on things in a huge way that is just negative. And it's not just one thing. As I mentioned, the Anthropocene is, is defined by pushing on everything at the same time time. And so the passenger pigeons and the way we approach a lot of things, and, and this has gotten worse within the past 50 years or so, um, is this idea of this anthropocent anthropocentric worldview where only humans' lives and their needs matters. So that's the Anthropocene. Now, 
that's in contrast to two other worldviews that are, you know, much more um, natural in, in, in the way you think about it. But the first is the biocentric worldview, which every organism, <coughs> such as our friend, the passenger pigeon, has the right to exist regardless of its benefits to humans. Or you can think about it like an ecocentric worldview where the entire intact ecosystem, including pigeons and us, matters. And I think those are direct, um, directly in contrast to that anthropocentric worldview, where the mm. anthropocentric worldview, and you can also think about it, it's gotten worse recently. And you can also think about it as like a capitalistic worldview, which is take, 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 take for the short term and don't really quite think about the long term, right? So that's sort of where we are, right? So where does, where does, um, where does sustainability, right? The title of this course is Environmental Science and Sustainability. How does, how does sustainability fit into this framework? Well, the reality is it goes against that anthropocentric worldview. It goes more in tune with that ecocentric worldview, ensuring that all resources are available indefinitely. And the resources that are required for the planet are vast. It's not just water, it's not just clean air, they're vast. The resources of human population are immense. And so when we think about the slaughter of our passenger pigeons, this is what we call um, unsustainable or not sustainable. Um, it's a pretty heavy buzzword. People like to use it a lot, especially the folks that, um, you know, like to uh, talk about the environment such as myself. Um, and uh, it just simply means um, making sure things are there for future generations, right? Making sure that if we're taking something from nature that it's there for an extended period of time. So clearly the passenger pigeon, we took and took and took and then it went extinct. So that research, research resource was wiped from the face of the planet. Clearly that's not sustainable. If we were to harvest the passenger pigeon sustainably, we would have took, 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 but made sure there was enough to keep those passenger pigeons alive and on the planet for future generations in high enough numbers that they could use them. And so, <clears throat> what's going on? There we go. Um, sustainability as a sort of uh, concept, we like to think of it as like making our environment, making our planet more resilient or resistant to change, right? So that if something bad happens to the planet, you know, like a drought, right? That by taking sustainably, the planet or that area can essentially weather the storm. That's that's sort of one of the ways we also like to think about sustainability, making the planet more resilient to bad things that happen, right? Have the, the planet have the capacity to absorb disturbance and adapt to ongoing change. Because as we'll talk about with, in the climate change lecture, the planet is not static, it is dynamic, it's changing all the time. Um, and I'll, the other thing I'll just make mention of about sustainability is that in 2015, and then again every year since then, uh, the United Nations has designated sustainable developmental goals um, as you know sort of the way going forward. And not just because the planet matters, but it's also we know that developing sustainably, whether it's economically or financially, or um, you know resource-wise, um, it's actually the best way to get rid of poverty and have sustainable economic growth. Um, and development. So, so that's the Anthropocene. And I hope, um, I hope I've conveyed just how dramatic a shift it is from natural things. There's nothing quite like us on the planet. Even like the, mo the most like uh, crazy organisms that have ever existed. Like if you think about beavers, right? Beavers do all sorts of crazy things to ecosystems. They're not even close to the level that humans are. We really are an unprecedented group of individuals, um, especially recently. We, um, we've done so much damage recently, it's, it's kind, of, uh, kind of shocking. And we'll talk about that as the semester sort of goes on. Um, and before, as a sort of a last um, portion of this talk, I wanted to discuss this concept of scientific literacy. Um, and I've been, you know, I've been teaching scientists and non-scientists for, you know, like almost 10 years now in some shape or form. And, you know, when I first started teaching this part of this lecture, I, I always never saw the point. Um, you know, I, I, people were, when I first started, you know, so you think of 2010, as a society, we were much more trusting in scientists as a, you know, as people, we were just 
we were willing to listen to doctors and, and scientists and say, wow, they, they got a lot of credibility. But um, more and more, I, and, and really has really ramped up in recent years is the amount of um, scientific, um, not scrutiny, that's the wrong word. The amount of scientific disbelief is through the roof. Um, and you could see that with, with coronavirus, you know, all the people that believe and still believe it's caused by 5G. You can look at the anti-vaccination movement. Um, you can look at climate change denial. All this stuff is caused by poor scientific literacy in some way, shape, or form. So I'd like to just spend a few minutes talking about scientific literacy because we're going to read a lot of stuff. We're going to talk about a lot of different things throughout the semester. And it's important to know that everything I give you to read and everything that we discuss is something that's just not like, oh, I just, I just found it on the internet. This is stuff that's you know, this is what the latest scientific information tells us. This is what, um, you know, this is what, you know, this is what we know from the scientific method. So we think about how science is done. We develop sort of this idea of there being a problem or an observation, right? You know, in this case, we could think of a very simple example, right? We recognize a problem. My cell phone won't work. I right? pretend my cell phone is dead. Well, scientific method, the way we sort of go through this is we collect data and then we say, okay, is my cell phone on and is it charged? Yes, cool. And then I say, okay, does my cell phone have a signal? No, okay, well, that, that, there, there's my data. And then I propose a hypothesis to the system. In the case, my hypothesis, which would be um, my cell phone does not work because there's no service. I test the hypothesis by moving to an area with service and making a call. Now that seems kind of, childish almost like um but the flow of information is really kind of nice there's a problem there's data an experiment potentially done i test it i have a hypothesis and if this failed i could go back to the drawing board and try again and that's inherently how science works you have a problem an observation you try stuff you get data, the data doesn't support it, you go back to the drawing board and try to figure out the way it works. And that's inherently a good thing about science is that if, even if something bad, even if your data says you were wrong, that's not a bad thing. Being wrong is never a bad thing in science. It's just a way for you to come back and try to find the actual correct answer. Now, as we develop a hypothesis, um, as we develop more and more evidence for our hypothesis with much, much more data, um, we start to develop what we call a scientific theory. And a scientific theory is not like, oh, I theorize that the moon is made out of cheese. Right? I, I theorize, right? Um, theory in science is kind of a big deal. Um, uh, theory in science is when you have a lot of data supporting an idea with not a lot of contradictory data. So the, for instance, like plate tectonics is a great theory um, that the, you know, the Earth's crust is on plates and it moves. And that's a really great theory. That's basically how we know things work. Um, just as a note, the theory of evolution is, a, is another great one. Heavily, heavily supported thing. Tons and tons of data, very little dissenting data. Um, so that's, that's sort of working way up. Come on. Let's go up for that. Uh, and eventually, we can also get to, um, I don't know why it's not showing, um, uh, scientific law, which is like, it's always true every second of the day. So like gravity, for instance, is a, is a scientific law. So the scientific method always invites you to question what's going on, but the questioning um, and the development is always about bringing in new data to support your ideas, building upon ideas. Um, and so when you, when you see people talk about climate change, for instance, and we'll, we'll talk about climate change later in the semester, and you see this is supported by mountains of data. And that's, that's, that's what we're going for here. Science is all about, you know, um, pulling in data to support your observations. Um, and so when we start to look at, you know, things in this class, where like such as climate change, there's, again, there's mountains of data to show it. And again, this is just another way to um, visualize the scientific method, actually from the textbook that um, um, you don't have to buy for the course, but if you wanted one, you could buy it. But um, I like I like funny cartoons, and you know, so and uh, that's that's just the way it is. I guess it's not cartoons. I guess it's just memes. But the scientific method breaks down is there's an observation with my favorite character of all time, Fry. Uh, there's a question. Uh, there's some sort of hypothesis. We develop a prediction. We do some experiments, which leads us to get some results, um, which allows us to either reject the hypothesis or develop a theory. But ultimately, these lead back and feed into themselves. And the scientific method, when done 
properly, when science is done properly, it protects itself from bad science. And there is a lot of bad science out there, don't get me wrong, but it does protect itself if the scientists are behaving ethically. So now uh, I'd like to just take a quick moment to talk about types of um, scientific studies there are. So um, we have observational versus experimental studies. And so these are just two papers from actually a, a professor at Bentley. Um, my colleague, uh, Dr. Elizabeth Stoner, she's a pretty awesome woman. Um, and observational studies, um, they, where they collect data in a real world setting without doing any manipulation. So you just observe what, you know, jellyfish do, you know, in this case, there's, in this paper is the effects of anthropogenic disturbance on the abundance and size of epibenthic jellyfish. And then we have an experimental study where you intentionally manipulate subjects in the lab or the field environment. And this was when they modify seagrass by jellyfish. So two different and distinct types of science. Um, when we think about like something like the development of the coronavirus vaccine, we're thinking about more of an experimental study, just as a known. Uh, climate change, we're thinking about a combination of experimental and observational studies. Um, both of these, as you can see, they're both published in what we call peer-reviewed scientific journals. And one of the, the fun things about, well, not so fun, but one of the important things about publishing in scientific journals. And this is the same for like economic journals or any financial journal or sociological journal, whatever journal you're talking about, is they're typically peer reviewed by experts in the field. So when she published this, um, you know, a couple of years ago, um, it was reviewed by experts on jellyfish and experts of marine biology and all that fun stuff to make sure that the science was up to snuff. And so when we talk about things in class, we're going to be not so much reading these, but we're pulling data from these to explain the concept of climate change or biodiversity or something like that. So I just wanted to, um, just to make that known. Um, in terms of scientific articles, as I mentioned, they are peer reviewed articles that are that do present the results of some experiment or observation by a scientist. Um, they're typically funded via the government. So the NIH, the National Institutes of Health, the National Science Foundation, um, are the ones that fund things here in the United States, as well as like the FDA and, and the CDC. But there's also agencies all over the world. Um, and a lot of science is actually funded by your tax dollars. So if it comes from the government, such as, you know, like, you know, this, these two here, um, they would science and that's pretty common. The, you know, the budgets of the NIH and the NSF are pretty big, you know, well, not big like compared to the military, but like, you know, they got, a, they got five or $6 billion a year. So pretty big chunk of change. Um, and you can also have private funding, which is by a company or investors. So if you think about like the Pfizer vaccine, that that was completely privately funded. Um, that's in contrast to say like the Moderna vaccine for COVID, which is funded by Moderna, as well as the United States government and other agencies. So there are there are conflicts of interest in terms of where the funding comes from. Just figured to make that known. Um, scientific articles also ha are published in different journals. And you may or may not know this, but journals have tiers. So some journals are just inherently better than themselves others. Uh, you can take a peek at that in this Wikipedia article about what's called the impact factor, if it interests you at all. Um, unlike, I mean, um, sorry, unlike, like everything else, there's a predatory aspect to scientific publishing. So there are predatory journals. And um, this article from Yale's library is fantastic. It talks about uh, predatory journals and it talks about, it gives you lists of known predatory journals. So it's basically people that are publishing garbage science as long as you pay them money. So you could go out and do a study about, you know, um, something crazy like how climate change isn't real and then publish it in a predatory journal if you just pay enough money. That's, that's what a predatory journal really is. Um, but the one thing I wanna um, make note is uh, I, I see a lot of uh, like news articles, you know, like from like MSNBC or, or you know, NPR that pick up scientific um, articles that are published in journals. Um, and one thing they all do is they, they make too many conclusions based upon one study. Like for instance, I saw uh, an ad um, um, the other day about this one bacterial strain that can help you um, gain weight and stuff like, you know, get more muscular. And it was based on one tiny study from years and years ago. And I, I, as a microbiologist, I was sitting there like, oh, that's just, that's just so wrong. But the key, the, the, the point of that little, little anecdote was that you always have to interpret individual scientific findings with caution. If one study says something and a bunch of other studies say the exact opposite, well, you kind of have to interpret that study with caution and with sort of a grain of salt almost. Um, and you can always sort of kind of figure out what's good and what's bad by looking at um, 
how the science was done. So good science protects itself from proper experimental design. I'm sorry, with proper experimental design as well as good statistics. So good science is always has large data sets, has lots of replication through space and time. I know that sounds kind of cool, but it just means that you know things are repeatable over time and they're repeatable in different locations. So think about the COVID vaccine, it's like effective in Africa and effective here in the United States. That's, that's what I'm getting at. Uh, there's proper control. So what happens if you don't get a vaccine versus when you get a do good vaccine, that's an important comparison. And the appropriate math. Do you have the right data sets to use the test you're trying to use? And do you have enough data to answer the question? And one of the pitfalls a lot of people make, because people are really bad with math in general, is this, um, this note of uh, correlation and causation. Uh, this is my, uh, my favorite topic in math, because a lot of people like to, um, and you'll see this in the things you you know, as you as you as you become more and more uh, interested in finances and stuff like that, but this idea that certain things are correlated with one another. If you change this, it might change this. But it's kind of an interesting thing, um, especially with biology, because sometimes if two things change together, they don't they're not always related. Um, and so to get around this idea of correlation and not equaling causation, you have to have a very large sample size to get at. Okay, if I get this vaccine, is it actually correlated with not getting the disease? Or is it just a fluke, right? Are they actually meaningfully mathematically correlated? And I like to show this um, this graph to show you, this is my favorite one. But if you have like an hour, maybe not an hour, maybe like 20 minutes of your time, this website I've linked at the bottom, which is called Spurious Correlations. It's, it's, it's really fun to do, um, where they look at um, really weird things that correlate with one another. And so for instance, uh, this is the number of people who drowned by falling into a pool in red um, and the number of Nicolas Cage films. <laughs> which clearly aren't related at all. But again, I love this. This is my favorite one because they're, they're really strongly correlated. When people die in pools, Nicolas Cage has made a bunch of films and vice versa. And so a lot of people get trapped into thinking because things are correlated, they cause the other. But clearly, even though these are correlated, Nicolas Cage films don't cause people to drown in pools, right? So it's important to think about that aspect when you're thinking about science as well. Um, and um, I'm not gonna uh, I'm not gonna talk about um, that last one because that's enough math for the day. Um, and I will also make mention there is a lot of bad science out there. Um, humans are not always ethical. You guys you guys know that. I don't have to tell you that. <laughs> humans aren't ethical, right? There's lots of weight reasons to do bad science, whether it's money or political reasons. Um, you know, you could do, you could see people cherry picking data, suppressing data. That's pretty common in climate change. Um, sometimes people do things inadvertently, like they have very poor experimental designs or they don't know how to use statistics properly. Um, as I mentioned, predatory journals are a big, bad area of science. And that's, again, that's a human greed sort of thing. Um, but science is, um, as you guys know, and coronavirus has brought this directly to our forefront, it's directly tied with your average everyday life. Bad science leads to bad policies, bad decisions, and potentially deaths, right? There was, there was some really shady science that went on early on in the coronavirus that showed hydroxychloroquine was an effective treatment. And it was really bad science by some folks at um, the uh, uh, Michigan Medical Center. Really, it was really bad. <laughs> and people were taking it thinking they were going to be cured from COVID, and it caused people to die. And so bad science leads to bad policies, bad decisions, and potentially people dying. And there is no better actually um, uh, way to actually show you this, but I actually just ha should have, just take a peek and read this, these two articles. If you've never um, dove into the anti-vaccination movement, it all started with some really bad science back in 1997 and 1998. Um, so again, bad science leads to bad policies, which leads to people so if you don't have, if you've never sort of taken a peek into this idea, I recommend you reading these two articles. It's kind of an interesting take about how bad science led to bad policies and conspiracy theories and all that fun stuff. So um, that's that's all I got for you guys today. I figured I'd end with a picture of my dogs um, cuddling or just being chunky and sleeping on the ground. I told you I'd show you pictures of my dogs. Look how cute they are. Um, so that's gonna be all we're gonna cover for the day. Um, so just sort of the key things to remember here, the Anthropocene, human influence, huge dramatic changes on the environment. Um, but definitely when you're thinking about what we're looking at, 
in terms of this class, know that it's always good, solid science. If you want to talk more or you have any questions about how to identify bad science or predatory science, let me know. But I hope I gave you sort of enough background information about bad science and good science to sort of allow you to better evaluate the things you're going to be seeing in class, as well as things you might see on social media or, you know, in your average everyday readings in given, you know, in, a, in like a magazine or whatever have you. All right, so I'm going to stop recording.